All right. Let's get started. Let me get the sign-in sheet started. Oh, there we go. TV's on. Okay. So um, let's just sort of take care of some housekeeping items first. So you all are aware, Friday the 13th, the lecture is going to be canceled. Um, I, I'm also, it's, uh, I'm probably going to have, uh, I'm not going to really have access to email on Friday. Uh, so if you write me and I'm not available, just, uh, uh, just recognize that. I'm probably will be on campus for a little bit tomorrow, but it's going to be pretty spotty at best. So just thought I'd give everybody a heads up. Let's look at the schedule. Homework eight is due on Monday. Um, after uh, a short bit of lecture today, uh, you'll be well equipped. There's only two problems, and you all should be able to tackle problem one, no problem, and uh, most of problem two, you should be fine. Uh, again, I think development length is a pretty rote and straightforward process. It's not very complicated. Um, I thought I would mention Engineering 452. If you are meant to be in Engineering 452, you should be in Engineering 452 right now. Okay. If you are not in Engineering 452, contact me. Um, that I've got a, a, there's a couple stragglers that uh, I have some paperwork that need to, that needs to be done. Yes. Well, that wasn't a question. This says contact me if you have any questions. So. No. Okay, all right, all right. Um, but yeah, in all seriousness, if you should be in Engineering 452, you are in Engineering 452. If not, there was either a, a course conflict or maybe you were overloaded and had some additional paperwork you need to get done. Uh, it's no big deal. Just let me know. Um, like I said, uh, we're canceling class on Friday. I debated this a little bit, and I actually am going to post a, a somewhat short video on columns. What I'm basically going to put in the video are column provisions, you know, how to compute the capacity of a column. And uh, honestly, for short columns, it's pretty simple. Just to give you some background, it's going to be 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete and FY times the area of the steel. Add them up, that's your capacity. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. It, for the most part, really is that simple. There's a few adjustment factors, bless you. And, uh, you know, your strength, your fee value changes a little bit. But that's it. That's pretty much all there is to it. But I'm going to post a short video on that. Um, and that will sort of make up for our lecture on Friday. When we come back Monday, we're going to hit the ground running on columns and beam columns. We can probably finish the main chunk of that next week. So that leaves us the final week, that leaves us dead week to sort of cover some additional topics. Um, so I'll probably come up with some worthy topics of discussion. It won't be anything that's on a homework. It won't be anything that's on the exam. But if you're interested in civil engineering, which I got a, a inkling some of you kind of thought that might be a good idea for a career. Um, it was a joke, not a very funny one. Um, this might be worth, worth looking at. So uh, again, Exams Monday, April 30th. We'll have our review on the 27th. Sound good? No question, I think so. What's that? No question, I think so. Well, it depends on uh, where we're at in schedule, and it depends on. Um, that's a good question about the 25th. It depends on where we're at in terms of uh, class schedule, and it depends on honestly what you all want to do. I'm actually leaning on, like, sort of having lecture, but then discussing some of one of these other topics, like nothing that is going to be on the exam, so maybe like continuous construction, maybe footings and walls, stuff like that. Just just really just for the heck of it, just if you all are interested. So, um, Which, if you're civil engineers, it might be a little interesting. So. Yeah. <laughs> you're in the wrong class. <laughs> um, any questions? All right. Any questions on the homework? All right, it's due Monday. And I'm not going to be here on Friday, so. Yeah, we should. It's not. It's not a long topic. It's not a long topic. Um, let's talk a little bit about hooks. So, um, up until now, we've been looking at the development length of straight, undeformed bars. So, um, I want to talk about deformed bars and how the development length changes. In short, 
the development length for a hook is a lot less than the development length for a straight bar. Which, I mean, think, if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. I mean, imagine playing tug of war with somebody and, you know, uh, you know, imagine the difference between holding the rope literally by, you know, with your hands and relying on, you know, your hand strength and on friction versus imagine that there was a knot tied in the rope and there's a loop and you can hook it like this, you know, let's say in the crook of your elbow. You're going to have a much stronger grip on the rope just based on the geometry. And that's sort of the same idea uh, with hooks. Now, there's only two hooks that are, that are really used in, um, in, in reinforced concrete design, and that's 90-degree hooks and 180-degree hooks. But the development length computation uh, is, is exactly the same. Okay, so let me put my re remote in. That would have helped a little bit ago. Here is the computation for the development length of a hook. Okay, so first off, the equation is a lot less involved than the previous equations that you've seen. Um, a couple of things worth mentioning. So there is no uh, top bar location factor, and there is no size factor. And, and if you think about it, that kind of makes sense because it's a different mechanism altogether. You know, if you remember, the size bar factor is all about surface area, you know. The smaller bars mean more surface area, means more contact with the concrete. But that's assuming that you're looking at the development length of a straight bar and you're relying on that sort of frictional development between the bends or the, the ribs of the, the, um, uh, the rebar and the contact with the concrete. But if you bend that bar, it's a different animal altogether. The bond mechanics are incredibly different. So you're not really worried about bar size. It's really more about that that geometry. So bar size factor doesn't have um, uh, anything to go in, uh, any, you know, any uh, issue. Same thing with top bar location, because again, you're, you know, even if your bars are on the top, that bend is sort of going down, so that, that issue gets, uh, gets taken away as well. Now, the epoxy coating factor is still there, because whether you bend the bars or not, you're still embedding an epoxy coated bar into concrete, so it is, there is still that slippery factor, uh, if you will, associated with the bar coating. There are also two new factors. There's a cover factor and a confinement factor. We're going to talk about those here in a sec, um, just so everybody's uh, aware. Now, the development length of a hook is never taken to be smaller than six inches or eight times the bar diameter. So whatever you compute, it's always, uh, uh, you know, if you computed a development length and it was five inches, you say, nope, it's six inches, or eight times the bar diameter, so whichever is the, the longer of those two. So, and, and the, if you recall, if you look at the development, the actual just um, development length formula, it has uh, a limit of 12 inches. So whatever you compute, if it's a straight bar, it, it, if you computed 11.2 inches, no, you take it as 12. So that's something to, uh, to account for there. Let me go back to hooks. Okay, so the new factors are the confinement factor and the cover factor. Um, and here's the, the long and short of it. So the cover factor, so if you recall, help me, help me out. What is cover? Let's just go back to basics. What is cover? Somebody tell me. So concrete past where the rebar is. In other words, you know, the, the distance between the surface of the rebar and the edge surface of the concrete, right? So um, first off, the cover factor, and, and it's, it's a lot like all the others, the cover factor and the confinement factor, the default is one. Okay, so it's always a default value of one. Okay, let's talk. Let's take the cover factor first. So the cover factor states that um, you are allowed uh, 0.7 for your cover factor if the following two apply. So if you have hooks that are comprised of number 11 bars uh, or smaller, if you have a lot more, if you have a, a lot of side cover, in other words, cover that's greater than or equal to two and a half inches, then your cover factor can be taken uh, as 0.7. Or if you're looking at 90-degree hooks and if the cover behind the hook is 2 inches. So when I say cover behind the hook, and this is just a, a schematic to give you kind of an idea, the cover behind the hook is talking about this dimension right here. In other words, if you've got, you know, if this distance, you know, it, when it says greater than 2 inches, it's talking about that distance. The side cover would be if I'm looking at this, this beam you know, let's say, you know, like this. So I've got, you know, the beam right here, and I've got, you know, bars like that. 
side cover is talking about that dimension. So this is side cover. Okay? And this is the, this right here, that's the cover behind the stirrup. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Any questions? Okay. Now, for confinement, um, we do still get the same sort of confinement benefit with hooks than we do with straight bars. If you remember, uh, in straight bar computations, we had that KTR value, that transverse reinforcement index. And what did that do? You know, any time that we accounted for transverse reinforcement, what did that do to the development length? Made it shorter, okay? Because that transverse reinforcement, the stirrups or anything like that, serves to confine that concrete. And by confining that concrete and keeping it contained, that's going to create a stronger bond between the concrete and the rebar, so that's going to give you a, an added perk on development length. Now, we get the same perk for hooks, but we handle it a little differently. So for hooks, we have, uh, so again, the default value is 1, but if our stirrup spacing is less than or equal to 3 times the bar diameter, and the last stirrup increment is less than or equal to 2 times the bar diameter, we can take that confinement value to be 0.8. So, so think of think about this. You know, one of the things that's worth mentioning is that these effects can be additive. In other words, you calculate a development length and you get a value. You can reduce it 20% here and then another 30% on top of that here. So you can definitely get some serious reduction in development length when you account for these factors. Now, give me one sec. When we talk about stirrup spacing, we're talking about this right here. This is your stirrup spacing and then that's your last increment as long as those dimensions are maintained, uh, you're good. Yes? Yes, yes. Well, or inside the whatever it's bonding to. What, whatever. It could be a column. If we're looking at a retaining wall, it could be the footing. Whatever it's bonding to. So. Does that make sense? You are right. You are right. Um, but let me also say this. Um, so you're talking about this region right here, the region inside the beam and the column. You're talking about that? Okay. So two things I'll add. You are correct that when we were designing stirrups uh, before, we were basically sort of starting our stirrups here and going out. Um, if we look at that joint, and let's go back to this joint as if we were in structural analysis land, okay? Back to 312 land. This particular joint would be one that transfers shear and moment because it's all connected, okay? What I'm getting at is that joint is probably in a structure that is statically indeterminate, okay? So imagine what we've been doing this semester, but then adding indeterminacy and moment distribution and matrix analysis and all that in there. So it's not that it's impossible, it's just what we've been doing so far in this semester is just assuming situations with simpler analysis, stuff that we could do by hand. This would involve just a little bit more rigorous calculations on the analysis side. And this is something I was thinking about talking about in the last week in regards to continuous construction. Because when you look at continuous construction, like, like here, here's sort of what I'm getting at. And, and I'm, I'm going to leave it at that because, you know, we do have, have to sort of move on. But let me ask you this. Let's take a look at this beam. And let's say it's just got distributed load on it, okay? Now, we've been doing beams like this all semester, right? Okay, now watch this. Let's do this. Let's take this beam and put it here, or this support and put it here. What does the moment diagram look like? Well, it looks like that, right? Remember that? So what that means is if you look at your reinforcement, you're going to have a lower layer of reinforcement in this region, but then you're going to have an upper layer of reinforcement here. But then you're going to have to take both those ends and you're going to have to extend them a development length. So you're going to have regions that are singly reinforced, regions that are doubly reinforced, Plus, if you have a doubly reinforced beam, what is its moment capacity this way versus its moment capacity this way? 
They're different if you've got different bar sizes on different ends. Do you see what I mean? So it's not harder, it's just longer. And there's a point when you're in a reinforced concrete design exam and it's 50 minutes, we got to crunch it a little bit. Do you see what I mean? So, but we're going to talk about this near the end. Sound good? So, so yeah. Everybody else good? Okay. All right. One other uh, uh, reduction I did want to mention, this still applies to, okay, the area of steel required versus the area of steel provided. Again, if you need three square inches and you provide six, that's a little crazy, but again, if you provided double the amount of reinforcement that is actually needed, you theoretically only need half as much development length. Because you don't need to develop it theoretically to its full capacity, you only need to develop it to half its capacity because you provided twice as much rebar. So just be, be aware of that. You can get some serious reductions on, uh, on development length if you start accounting for all of these little things. Now, so what we've got here is uh, uh, sort of our final development length example. And what I'm doing is I'm going to take some polar opposites to really show you what can happen on the development length side. So we're going to do this problem, but we're going to do it two ways. We're going to assume straight bars with a KTR of zero, and then we're going to assume bars ending in a 90 degree hook. Okay? So you're going to see some vastly different development lengths. Now we've got um, a couple things to point out. It's 4 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. All of the bars are top bars, even these ones down here, because you've got to have 12 inches of concrete. Now this is 13. But if you come down half a bar diameter, that's still over 12. So these are all top bar factors. And what's the other thing that's worth mentioning about this problem? Well, no, not that. We, I mean, we just, that, that won't affect development length, whether it's cantilevered or not. It doesn't really matter. What's that? They're epoxy coated bars. So that's going to affect some things uh, as well. So let me be lazy and snip tool this. Y'all good? All right, what is happening here? Let's try this again. I had it open. Oh, oh no. There we go. You can go over here. All right. I'm not even going to write example 17 because I put it right there. Okay. Now, let's take this one at a time. So let's start off with, um, with some of our parameters. Now, we've got our material parameters. We've got 4 KSI concrete. Um, we're going to assume normal weight. So we're just going to take our lambda value to be 1. Um, let's take this one at a time. So let's look at adjustment factors. Okay, so what is psi t equal to? One. Yep, 1.3. So this is 1.3 and our reasoning is going to be top bars. Okay, now, what about this one? What about our epoxy coating factor? This is going to require you all to dig back into your notes a little bit. Now, if you remember, it's not going to be one, but there's two cases. So we're going to really dig into the notes on this one. I'll tell you what, I'll help you out a little bit. Okay. Okay, we got one, so what are the two options? We've got 1.2 and 1.5, right? Here, I, what the, what's going on with my, you know what? I'm going to redo this. This is getting weird. But while, while we're doing, 
It has now frozen. Is it even recording? Oh my goodness. What the? So guess what we're going to do? We're just going to end the task of the smart, no smart notebook, although it is being snarky. I'm not, no, we're not going that far. We're not going that far. All right, let's, let's end the task. Okay, all right. Okay, please work. I'm still recording. You know what? No. No, I'm good. All right, hold on. Edit, copy, full screen, bam. Resize the picture a little bit. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Let's see. Where were we? We had lambda is one. We had adjustment factors. The what? I, what I, I'm confused, huh? I, we're doing yeah. I want to show you the difference because I think you're going to be surprised how much it's it's really different. Okay, so we got epoxy coating bars. Now where were we? Uh, okay, right here. Here we go. Here we go. So we have. Epoxy coated bars with the cover less than the three uh, times the bar diameter or the clear spacing that's uh, less than six times the bar diameter. So is that the case for this problem? How? how now, that's a great, it is, but, but how do we know that? No, all right, here, ah, now I'm glad you said that. What's the bar diameter? No. What is the bar diameter of a number nine? I'm, but we actually need to know this because the development length computation has the bar diameter in it. What is the diameter of a number nine? That's what I'm asking. No, but we need to know the number. Well, you're actually right, but what I'm getting at is I'm going to go way back when, way back. But it's also in your textbook. And how, how is that on me? All right, this is on slide 63. You might want to write this down on slide 63. These are the diameters of standard rebar. The diameter of a number nine is not nine eighths, okay? It is the required diameter in, core, in order to get one square inch, which is 1.128. You need that value in order to calculate development length, so you need to know where to find this. So there you go. You are quite welcome. Told you we were going back in the notes. So. The diameter is 1.128, and the, the multiply, uh, multiply that by 6, that's not going to meet this, and it's not going to meet your cover. So we'll say that this is, in fact, 1.5. And I'm going to do my reasoning as saying epoxy-coated bars uh, I messed that up. with small cover. Now, 
Before we move on, we have a situation that we haven't dealt with yet, so note What is that? Say it again. Um, what's, what's the issue? Well, it, it's greater than 1.7, so what, what that means is in our equation, we're going to take psi t, psi e, we're going to take that to be 1.7. And you'll see how that gets accompanied uh, here in a quick second. Now, what is psi s? What's psi s going to be for this problem? One, and, and help me out, why is that? Yeah, they're, they're number nine bar, and that's greater than the magic number of number six. So that's 1.0, and we'll say number nine bars. Okay, we'll go ahead and put our bar diameter on here, and that's 1.128 inches. Now, let's see if you all can eyeball this and tell me, what is C sub B? I hear a 2.25. Do I have a second on that? Our top, our top uh, dimension is two and a half. That's two and a half, and then halfway in between, that's two and a quarter. So we take the smallest. Everybody okay with that? All right. So far, so good. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so center to center. That drawing didn't really. Yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, if you had bars up here that were like one inch, then you'd use that one, okay. yeah. But they're all in a clear grid spacing. That's a good point. If, this, if these two layers were like two inches apart, then CB would be one inch because halfway. That's a good question. All right, everybody good? Now, to keep this uh, uh, just sort of a demonstrative example, we're going to keep, uh, keep, keep KTR to be zero. Could we even compute KTR if we wanted? What's that? Did you say yes or no? No. no. Why? <laughs> say it again. There's no stirrup information. Remember, KTR is 40 times the transverse area of reinforcement divided by the number of bars in a single layer in your stirrup spacing. The only thing we know is the number of bars in a single layer, which is what? No, oh, in a single layer. All the single layers. All the single layers. <laughs> and a tweet from Dr. Money Michelson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's the 4.5. Yeah, that's, that's the overall spacing. The CB is half the spacing. Because remember, CB is, is trying to determine what that failure circle is going to look like. So it's halfway over. Yes, sir? So KTR, we know the formula for it, but what actually is it? It's, it's, telling, it, it's basically an empirical way of giving you uh, an understanding how much that confining steel is helping your development length. We can't compute that on this problem. We don't have any idea about our stirrups, so we couldn't do it if we, even if we wanted to. Does that make sense? Now, it, it begs the question, well, if your stirrup spacing changes across your length, does that change your development length? Yeah, it does. So um, what you would do is just pick your worst case scenario right at the point of termination and just go from there. So good point. Everybody good? All right, so we only have a few quick calcs to do. We have... C sub B plus KTR over DB. So that is 2.25 inches. Remember, KTR, that, whoop, that's in inches. I always write zero, but I should write zero inches. We have to do this independently to see if it's bigger than 2.5. And, and 
that's the maximum. Give me like a couple seconds and I think I'll be able to explain it a lot, a lot clearer when we actually do the cow. So this is zero inches and this is 1.128 inches. What does this come out to be? 1.99. Now that's less than 2.5, so, so we're good. Okay. I'll be able to answer your question in like five seconds. Okay. So to compute the development length, Okay, so to compute the development length, what we're going to do is this, okay, 3 over 40, all right, we're going to have, let's see, Fy over lambda times square root of Fc prime, and then, let's see, we've got psi t, psi e, psi s, and then we have our ratio, c sub b plus ktr, over db, and then we multiply all of that by d sub b. Now, I want everybody to pay attention up here before you start writing everything down, because I, I want everybody to see what I'm going to do here. So watch this. Okay, so let's take the top first. Okay, so I have three. What's my Fy? 60,000 PSI. Now watch this. What's psi t? Exactly, exactly. We can't incorporate psi t and psi e individually. So what I'm going to do is this whole term is going to be 1.7, okay? And then 1.0 and then db is 1.128 inches, okay? Make sense? Okay. As for the bottom, we have 40 times 1 times the square root of 4,000 PSI, and then we have 1.99. So to go back to your question, the answer is, is this, okay? See how I replaced this with 1.7? I did that because it violated this limit. If this violated that limit, I would just write 2.5 here. That, that's the only difference. I'm doing it separately so that I know whether or not I need to replace or not. That's the, the maximum allowable value of this. Just like the maximum allowable value of this product is 1.7. So if it ever goes above 1.7, you just use, you just use it at, at that, uh, that ceiling value. Same thing here. If this value goes over 2.5, 2.5 is the ceiling, so we cap it off there and just use that here. That's why we do that value separately. So that, you know, if we didn't do that calc separately, we would just throw the values into the equation and not know. Does that make sense? Okay. Everybody else good? All right. Now, if I plug and chug, what do I get? So we'll say 68.6 inches. Does that make sense? Now, watch this. Let me show you something. Now, let's look at the hook. Okay. So we have a 90 degree hook. Okay. I'm, I'm going to show you, I want to show you this, I, I just want to do this for demonstrative purposes to really show you how much development length is drastically reduced by doing a hook. So watch this. Let's do this for let's just do, do it for the default value, for values of one. Just watch what happens. Our development length is Fy All right. Those three factors 50 That's our formula for the development length of hooks. Just watch this. On top 60,000 PSI times, now keep in mind, these are epoxy coated bars too, they're slippery. So 1.5, now we're going to take these two values to be 1, then 1.128 inches, then 50 times 1 times square root of 4,000. 
Just tell me what you get for this. 28.46? That's serious, isn't it? By bending that bar, we cut our development length from 68 inches to 32 inches. Okay, watch this. Watch what happens if we are able to apply those reduction factors. Let's say that we're able to get a cover factor of 0 0.7 and a, re, uh, uh, a confinement factor of 0 0.8. Can anybody tell me what the development length is? I mean, just go ahead and plug and chug. What happens if this is 0 0.7 and this is 0 0.8? What does that come out to be? Seventeen point nine eight. So this went from sixty-eight inches to eighteen inches. Like that's serious. That is a serious saving in development length, right? I mean, imagine that's going from embedding that rebar what five and a half feet versus embedding it like this. It, there's one more reduction that we didn't apply. What's that? anybody, anybody know what the other reduction that we didn't apply is? The area of steel provided versus the area of steel required, right? We didn't, we didn't even look at that. And that, is that more often than not going to be something we can apply? Yeah, because there's only so many bars in, in, that are available, only so many multiples and iterations of bars. So if you're going over, you can reduce that development length even further. We could have a development length that's 16 inches, 15 inches. Easy for this problem, okay? Does that make sense? Now, we cannot determine the confinement factor on this problem because we don't have any information on the stirrups. We could look at the cover factor. Do we have ample cover? Let's see. Oh, let me go back here. All right, so we got number 11 hooks, number 11, uh, so we have number 11 or smaller hooks. We're dealing with number nine bars on this problem, right? Our side cover has to be greater than or equal to two and a half inches. But we don't quite have that because our clear bar spacing on the side is two and a half inches. But what if we took these bars and moved them in like an inch? We're not talking about that much. Man, we get a 70% reduction on our development length. And if we just provide a few extra stirrups in the back, we can redu reduce it even further. Do you all see what I mean? That, that's, it wouldn't really take a lot of effort to take this, this, uh, uh, take this uh, beam and reduce its development length very, very significantly. Again, hooks will do quite a bit. They'll do quite a bit of work for you. Yes? When you're designing a building, mm -hmm. you're in a column job. Yes. Mm-hmm. You're saying, would you upsize the column? Uh, it depends. It depends on the scenario. I mean, you, there are ways to fix this. There are ways to fix your development length problem. Like you could throw more steel into the beam, and then throwing more steel into the beam, you could get a reduction. I'm not saying that that's not an option. I'm not saying that. But if you've got a 30-story building, and you make each of your columns an extra inch in diameter or an extra inch in size, I mean, Multiply that over the entire building. How much extra concrete are you putting in that building? Is it worth it? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the, the, the conditions. One of the other things you've got to consider with columns, especially if you're using precast elements or ready-made forms, which is pretty common, your column sizes are coming in pretty standard sizes, you know, like 12 inches, 14 inch, 16, 18 inches. So a lot of times, you're, you might be upsizing those columns anyways based on ready-made forms, based on what's available. So I'm not, I don't want you to say it's not, I don't want to say it's not an option. It most certainly is an option. I'm just asking that whenever you face that problem as an engineer that you just take a step back and go, is this going to affect the, how much is this going to affect the overall project? You know, like if you were in, like here's sort of what I would say. Like if, let's say you're in a corrosive environment, you've got, so you have to use like some sort of coating on your bars, but you, know, you can't have uncoated bars. 
you don't have room for development, you know, and you, you, know, you could make your columns bigger, or you could like hot dip galvanize your bars. You'd get the same corrosion protection, and you wouldn't have a 1.5 on your epoxy coating factor. You see what I mean? Now, what if you have a simple column that's too big to be coming in? Do you have to worry about the rebar hitting each other? Yep. Okay. Yep, you do. So you, you'll probably have to like stagger something, you know, uh, you know, from bar to bar, you know, like they're going this way, then going that way, then going this way, and going that way, doing like a checkerboard pattern as they intersect. As long as you've got ample um, space between those clear bars, you're good. And the space between those clear bars is going to be a function of your aggregate size. So, yeah. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a great question. And the, so the question was, what about, I mean, the bend on the bar? And that's why, that's why ACI has pretty specified, pretty, you know, prescriptive requirements on bend geometry. I mean, you know, when you're bending this bar, like specifically on like 180 degree hooks, that bend radius is a function of the size of the bar. Like if the bar gets too big, you have to change the geometry of that bend a little bit. So, so you're right. I mean, like I remember being in the lab and I was uh, bending rebar for, for a particular specimen. And, you know, if you're not using the right bar size and you start bending it, you'll snap the bar in half. But the answer is to just follow the, the standard details and, and you, won't, you won't have a problem. For smaller bars, you're able to achieve a tighter bend radius. But if you start getting to number nines to the 11s, you've got to up that radius a little bit so you don't start failing your bars. But it's a real point. Well, if it if it did not if you did not embed that bar enough, okay, and you followed the spec on the appropriate bend geometry, what's going to happen is you're going to crack the concrete. You're going to fail the concrete. In other words, if I'm supposed to embed that 12 inches and I only embed it six inches and I start loading it, what's going to fail is I'm going to start cracking the concrete and ripping it out. Does that make does that answer your question? That's what's going to happen. Now, if you start screwing with these, these bend radii and start bending it too tight or not bending it appropriately, well, uh, yeah, it's possible that you fail the bar. It's very possible. But you'd probably notice some serious distress on the bar as you're placing it. You know what I mean? Like, if, like I, if you've ever bent rebar, if, you, if anybody's ever done that, if you bend it too tight, it'll just snap. So you won't place it because it'll... I would hope that you don't just... <laughs> I've answered that question before. Oh, Lord. Yes? Yeah. It doesn't, it, it, that's a good question, but it doesn't really matter. See, uh, the closest analogy I can think of is, do you remember my analogy about the, uh, the, the tug of war? And imagine if there's a loop tied into the rope, okay? Once that loop is big enough for your arm to fit into it, it doesn't matter if that loop is this big or this big, you're getting the same development. What this is saying is that that, that depth on that hook has to be at least 12 bar diameters. If it's 100 bar diameters, it's still going to fail and crack this concrete in the same fashion. So it's not going to help. So. And a lot of times, you don't have the room anyways, because, you know, like, I, I, I think of, like, wall development. So, you, so you've got your wall, and then the stem where the foundation is, and you've got your development length going this way. Well, this is your footing on the wall. That bar can't go that far because the footing's only so wide. You see what I mean? That's, that's a good question, though. Any, anything else? Anything else? Okay, all right. I want to at the very least sort of kind of mention columns. Uh, and I want to very, very briefly um, discuss some of the provisions associated with columns. Honestly, the analysis and design of short columns is about the easiest thing you will do in this class because it's simple. It's simple lookups, simple computations. I, I can't even make it up. We're going to start off with columns that are experiencing purely axial load. In other words, here's a column, pushing on it like this. It's that simple. The next thing that we're going to do near the end, and this is the last thing that will be on the test, is what happens if you have a column that's pushed on 
and bent at the same time. And that is a very common instance if you're looking at the lateral resisting system of a building. Because if you've got that column, for instance, that column right there in the wall, it is holding up two things. Holding up the building above it, so axial load, and what's hitting it this way? Wind. So wind or earthquakes would tend to load the column this way. So you've got a column that's being bent and loaded axially at the same time. So we're going to do both of those. We'll do axial load first and then do axial load plus bending moment. So we turn those elements beam columns because they're being bent and experiencing axial load. Now we'll discuss buckling later. Buckling isn't going to be on your exam, but it, it's pretty, it, it's not very, very difficult, at least the way that we handle it. But I do want you to be exposed to how we, uh, uh, how we handle this. We'll start off by assuming that the columns just experience compression and fail under material limits. See, so if you ever hear me use the term short columns versus long columns, the difference is short columns, we do not assume buckling occurs. For long columns, we handle the effects of buckling. So for short columns, and we're going to stop here in a second. I know you all are packing up. But for short columns, we just limit the concrete stress to 0.85 FC prime, and that's it. Um, the last thing I do want to show you is the difference between square columns and circular columns. We do deal with both in reinforced concrete design. Around these parts in, in West Virginia in this area, more often than not, we're going to deal with square columns here. Circular columns tend to be much more efficient in earthquake zones. Um, the spiral reinforcement that goes down the, the column tends to confine the column a little better and help it during earthquake analysis. I'm going to show you how to do the capacity of both, but um, I just want you to be aware that around here, you can use both, but I, I mean, circular columns really do a lot better in, in earthquake uh, territories. I will discuss in the video this, the, the capacity and the, um, the, the how, how, do you, how to compute this, but again, I think you're going to find this is really, really simple. So I'm going to stop here. Um, I, uh, homework's due Monday, don't forget that. I'm going to be out of here on Friday, so I will see you all on Monday. You all have a wonderful weekend.